My name is Gita Narlikar, and I am a faculty member in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. Today, I want to share with you how our findings are making us rethink genome packaging. What do I mean by that? Let's start with 23andMe. You all know that you can send 23andMe a sample of your spit. And from the DNA in your spit, 23andMe can tell you your risk factors for different diseases. For example, your risk factor for getting Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Now, think about this. Somehow, the DNA in your spit cell is telling you how your brain cell might behave or misbehave. Isn't that amazing? How does that, ha how does that happen? Well, it turns out the DNA in all of our cells in our body is almost essentially the same. So that can explain some things. But that then raises a new question. If the DNA in our spit cells is the same as the DNA in our brain cells, why does a spit cell look and behave so differently than a brain cell? Turns out a lot of this has to do with how that DNA is packaged in each of these cells. In a spit cell, part of the DNA is tightly wound up and off limits, and another part of the DNA is available to be read. In contrast, in brain cell, a different part of the, G the DNA is packaged and off limits, and a different part of the DNA is available to be read. And that helps determine the identity of the cell as a, stem, as, a, as a spit cell versus a brain cell. Now, you've heard that many cancers are caused by mutations in DNA. What is interesting is many of these mutations actually mess up how that DNA is packaged. And so what you get are cells with identity crises. So a brain cell with mutations in the DNA messes up how the DNA is packaged, and now the brain cell no longer behaves like a brain cell, but behaves like a cancer cell. So you can see how packaging of the DNA is really important to determine the identity of a cell. And that's what we are studying. We are trying to understand, using the tools of biochemistry and biophysics, how our DNA is packaged in our cells. Now, before I tell you what we've learned, let's take a step back and talk about scale. If you take the DNA in any one of your cells and stretch it end to end, it's about six feet long, almost as tall as Michelle Obama. Imagine that. Now, this long piece of DNA somehow has to fit into a cell which is one hundredth the width of your hair. It's mind boggling. How does this happen? How does nature solve this problem? And this gets to the heart of curiosity driven research. Now, it turns out people have been studying this for a while, for decades. And what we know is in textbooks, what we know is that if you imagine the DNA as a long, thin piece of string, just like you organize string by wrapping it around wooden spools, nature organizes DNA by wrapping it around spools of proteins. These spools that come together and form these highly compacted structures that keep the DNA off limits. And if you look into textbooks and ask how do textbooks describe these spools, they describe these spools like wooden spools, rigid bodies that are there mainly to organize DNA. Now what we found is that these spools are not at all rigid. They're not at all static. They have personalities. They change shape. They dance. Now, if you are trying to organize a bunch of string around spools and your spools start changing shape, that's going to be a disaster. But for nature, this is an enormous opportunity. So nature uses these dynamic spools, these dancing spools, to coax a stem cell to become a brain cell or to coax stem cell to become a spit cell. Now imagine if we could learn from nature and use the same idea, but now instead of coaxing a stem cell to become a brain cell, we could coax a cancer cell that has an identity crisis back into the cell type it came from. So we could coax a brain tumor cell back into a normal brain cell. This is exactly what we are now working on in collaboration with many colleagues at UCSF. So what is really exciting to me is what started out as a really basic curiosity-driven question, what makes a stem cell behave differently than a brain cell, is now leading us to new ways to target cells that are cancerous. Thank you for listening.